throughout the whole countryside, the Luca farm was known as the manor. No one knew why. The peasants, doubtless, attached to this word, manor, a meaning of wealth and of splendor, for this farm was undoubtedly the largest, richest, and the best managed in the whole neighborhood. The immense court, surrounded by five rows of magnificent trees, which sheltered the delicate apple trees from the harsh wind of the plain. Enclosed in its confines, long brick buildings used for storing fodder and grain, beautiful stables built of hard stone and made to accommodate thirty horses, and a red brick residence which looked like a little chateau. Thanks for the good care taken, the manure heaps were as little offensive as such things can be. The watchdogs lived in kennels, and countless poultry paraded through the tall grass. Every day at noon, fifteen persons, masters, farmhands, and the women folks seated themselves around the long kitchen table where the soup was brought in steaming in a large blue-flowered bowl. The beasts' horses, cows, pigs, and sheep were fed, well fed and clean. Maître Luca, a tall man who was getting stood, would go round three times a day, overseeing everything and thinking of everything. A very old white horse, which the mistress wished to keep until its natural death, because she had brought it up and had always used it, and also because it recalled many happy memories, was housed, through sheer kindness of heart, at the end of the stable. A young scamp, about fifteen years old, Isidore Duval by name, and called for convenience Zidor took care of this pensioner, gave him his measure of oats and fodder in winter, and in summer was supposed to change his pasturing place four times a day, so that he might have plenty of fresh grass. The animal almost crippled, lifted with difficulty his legs, large at the knees and swollen about the hoofs. His coat which has no longer carried, looked like white hair, and his long eyelashes give to his eyes a sad expression. When Zidor took the animal to pasture, he had to pull on the rope with all his might, because it walked so slowly, and the youth bent over and out of breath would swear at it, exasperated at having to care for this old neck. The farmhands, noticing the young rascal's anger against Coco, were amused and would continually talk of the horse to Zido, in order to exasperate him. His comrades would make sport with him. In the village he was called Coco Zido. The boy would fume, feeling an unholy desire to revenge himself on the horse. He was a thin, long-legged, dirty child with thick, coarse, bristled red hair. He seemed only half-witted and stuttered as true ideas were unable to form in his thick, brute-like mind. For a long time he had been unable to understand why Coco should be capped, Indignant at seeing things wasted on this useless beast, since the horse could no longer work, it seems to him unjust that he should be fed. He revolted at the idea of wasting oats, oats which were so expensive, on this paralyzed old plug, 
and often, in spite of the orders of Matt Luca, he would economize on the next food, only giving him half measure. Hatred grew in his confused, childlike mind, the hatred of a stingy, mean, fierce, brutal and cowardly peasant. When summer came, he had to move the animal about in the pasture. It was some distance away. The rascal, angrier every morning, would start with his dragging step across the wheat fields. The man working in the fields would shout to him jokingly, Hey, Zido, remember me to Coco? He would not answer, but on the way, he would break off a switch, and as soon as he had moved the old horse, he would let it begin grazing. Then, treacherously sneaking up behind it, he would slash its legs. The animal would try to escape, to kick, to get away from the blows, and run around in circle about its rope as though it had been enclosed in a circus ring. And the boy would slash away furiously, running along behind, his teeth clenched in anger. Then he would go away slowly, without turning round. While the horse watched him disappear, his ribs sticking out, panting as a result of his unusual exertions, not until the blue blues of the young peasant was out of sight would he lower his thin white head to the grass. As the nights were now warm, Coco was allowed to sleep out of doors, in the field behind the little wood. Zido alone went to see him. The boy threw stones at him to amuse himself. He would sit down on an embankment about ten feet away and would stay there about half an hour from time to time throwing a sharp stone at the old horse, which remained standing tight before his enemy, watching him continually and not daring to eat before he was gone. This one, though, persisted in the mind of the young scamp. Why feed this horse, which is no longer good for anything? It seemed to him that this old nag was stealing the food of the others, the goods of the man and God, that he was even robbing him, Zidur, who was working. Then little by little, each day, the boy began to shorten the length of rope which allowed the horse to graze. The hungry animal was growing thinner and starving. Too feeble to break his bonds, he would stretch his head out toward the green, tall, tempting grass, so near that he could smell, and yet so far that he could not touch it. But one morning Zidor had an idea. It was not to move Coco anymore. He was tired of walking so far for that old skeleton. He came, however, in order to enjoy his vengeance. The beast watched him anxiously. He did not beat him that day. He walked around him with his hands in his pockets. He even pretended to change his place, but he sank the skate in exactly the same hole and went away overjoyed with his invention. The horse, seeing him leave, neighed to call him back, but the rascal began to run, leaving him alone, entirely alone in this field. Well tied down and without a blade of grass within reach. Starving, he tried to reach the grass which he could touch with the end of his nose. He got on his knees, stretching out his neck and his long, drooling lips, all in vain. The old animal spent the whole day in useless, terrible efforts. The 
the sight of all that green food which stretched out on all sides of him served to increase the gnawing pangs of hunger. The scamp did not return that day. He wandered through the woods in search of nests. The next day he appeared upon the scene again. Coco, exhausted, had lain down. When he saw the boy, he got up, expecting at least to have his place changed. But the little peasant did not even touch the mallet, which was lying out on the ground. He came nearer, looked at the animal, threw at his head a clump of earth which flattened out against the white hair, and he started off again whistling. The horse remained standing as long as he could see him. Then, knowing that his attempts to reach the nearby grass would be hopeless, and he once more lay down on his side and closed his eyes. The following day, Zidor did not come. When he did come at last, he found Coco still stretched out. He saw that he was dead. Then he remained standing, looking at him, pleased with what he had done, surprised that it should already be all over. He touched him with his foot, lifted one of his legs and let it drop, sat on him and remained there, his eyes fixed on the grass, thinking of nothing. He returned to the farm, but did not mention the accident, because he wished to wander about at the hours when he used to change the horse's pasture. He went to see him the next day. At his approach, some crows flew away. Countless flies were walking over the body and were buzzing around it. When he returned home, he announced the event. The animal was so old that nobody was surprised. The master said to two of the men, Take your shovels and dig a hole right where he is. The man buried the horse at the place where he had died of hunger, and the grass grew thick, green and vigorous, fed by the poor body.